Okay, welcome. So in this video, I found a way on how to automate the pen testing process and how to make them faster, easier, and more accurate. Now, in order to explain that and to go into the main point of the video, we need to make sure that you know how a pen test is actually conducted. So here I'm going to create a new canvas just to demonstrate this whole process. We're going to call that pen testing. And we're going to speak about the base pen test methodology when it comes to executing the tags, information gathering, and so on. So each pen test definitely starts with metadata. So I call that metadata. You can call that anything you want, but essentially this is the phase. Let's do that phase one, where you actually contact with the client, explain, ask what they need, set up the scope, set up credentials, and understand all the specifics about the pen testing that you're gonna do. Now, after you have all the metadata, including the scope and everything you need, then you're gonna carry out some information gathering. So phase two is always gonna be, at least usually it is, information gathering, like that. Now, good pen testing is not just by accepting the scope and doing that, but also trying to find more targets and to ask the contact person if it's okay to do it like that, if it's okay to do a little bit more pen testing on this, because you might find vulnerabilities. But in one form or another, after you get along with the contact person, you always need to carry out information gathering. In this information gathering, you need to carry out and execute a recon process, which is going to help you get information about your targets. This can include subdomains, additional DNS, NTLM authentication endpoints, list of usernames, web applications, frameworks, map for each application, GoBuster, and so on and so on and so on. Now, usually this divides into two points. So on the one hand side, you have the OSINT, aka passive reconnaissance, or on the next hand, hand, uh, sorry, hand thing, you have the active reconnaissance, which is everything which comes to do with NMAPs, Nuclease, Nictus, Scanners, and all kind of that fuzzing also is, is here. Now, uh, when you're done with information gathering, the key aspect of the penetration test, and that's actually how the pen test is, that's what pen test is, is you actually need to get all of the information you already acquired in some form or another, and you need to map them to specific vulnerabilities. So in phase three, you need to do vulnerability mapping because this is what separates the pen test from the QA or any other assessment. Because here you have a lot of information and then you have to use all of the information which is provided and then map as much as possible vulnerabilities on the targeted systems. Now I can give you a super nice example of that. If you find a login page and you try to log in, let's say 10 times, just by doing so, you have information that you can log in 10 times and nobody, nothing is blocking you. But on the other hand of things, and that's where phase three is actually coming from, you can use that into actually mapping a vulnerability that there's no mechanism that stops you and you can then carry out a brute force attack, which is a phase four. So in that case, phase four is attack, AKA execution. Now, as mentioned before, the example is, is quite nice because just by doing the logins, you get the information that nobody, nothing is blocking you and you can do the logins. Then you can map that to missing security mechanism or missing brute force protection. And then you can actually execute the attack based on that vulnerability you have mapped. And now here, just here, you can use your tools such as Hydra, Burp Suite, or any other tool that you wish. But the point is it's used here. So see how many things you have to do before you get into the point where you actually need to execute the attack, you actually need to execute the tool and in a nutshell, conduct the assessment. Now, when that thing happens, whether or not the attack is successful, I used to do like that. From here, move all the way back to here, no matter what happens. Why? Because imagine scenario one, you have access, let's, let's actually map that. In scenario one, you actually have access to another account, so uh, access granted or uh, infrastructure or internal network or any other, then you have to use the newly acquired access to again, perform information gathering, scan as much as possible, see as much details as possible, and then use these details into mapping specific vulnerabilities and then executing them again and then again 
repeat the cycle. Now, if we have another, uh, the, the other case, which is access is not granting, which is also scenario two attack failed. Let's say you conduct a brute force attack, but you were, you were not able to actually compromise any user. In that case, the attack failed. But here again, you have to do exactly the same thing. You have to get on, try to do collect more information, try to use this information into map more vulnerabilities and try to exploit these vulnerabilities. So from the pen testing perspective, I can say that the most crucial component and the most crucial part is actually the phase two information gathering. Because on the one hand side, if you have good enough information on your pockets, then you can map a lot of vulnerabilities from this information from which you can exploit maybe some of them. But if you don't have information, then you cannot map any vulnerability and then you cannot pretty much execute attack. I'm going to pause the video just to say massive thanks to all of my Patreon sponsors. Thank you so much. This is the way to show appreciation to my work and in any benefit for that, you are added to specific Discord membership as well as custom projects, which I know you can find handy. So if you have further appreciation and you want to support my work so I can make more videos like this one, don't hesitate, become my Patreon. Thank you so much. Moving on. And see, here's a linear pattern. That means that each successful attack is not just like in the movies, you just spam a few keyboards and you say, I'm in, but it's actually a product of deep research of finding information, mapping vulnerabilities and executing the attack. Now, the key point is that no matter what you do from here on, on from here on out, you have to also repeat the cycle and go back to phase two. Now, in today's video, we're going to speak about something that can help these two phases. I found a tool in my Discord, so make sure to join. That's where we share experience and knowledge. Some of the guys there shared it, and this tool actually saves a lot of time from phase three and phase four. So let's see what it is. But before that, I'm going to showcase how we can combine that with DeepSeek. Now, in order to get started, I have set up my environment. My, envi my environment looks quite simple, and you may be already found it in some of my previous videos. So, for example, if we go to maybe ADS, no, it's not there. It's gonna be it's gonna be in the screen you see. I don't have it in my notes, but I'm gonna actually modify it and paste in the screen as an image so you can see the environment. But essentially, we have a PFSense firewall. Then we have a B box. In our case, that's all we need. And if you didn't know, B box is an amazing virtual machine which actually is having a lot of vulnerabilities inside just for training purpose. So we can pretty much practice web app testing, network testing and all other stuff because it has a lot of things to offer. And now on the client side, we have just the B-Box and just the PFSense firewall. And the B-Box is actually forwarded on the PFSense so I can access it externally. So if I go back to my Kali VM, which is actually here, and if I refresh the screen, you can see that I can access the application which is on my B-Box with the external IP address of the PFSense firewall. Now, the key point is here. Let's explain uh, in practical terms what is usually done without this tool, and then we can move in and explain the difference and say why for me it is better. Now, here usually what you do when you go land into some application or any other form of service, you need to, as mentioned, obtain information about it, right? So in that case, all I can do is type control U or do right click and view page source. And from there, I want to try to maybe identify versions of the software, backend engines, is there is a CMS active or any other plugins which I might exploit, right, to gather information. And just in this example, which is quite simple, but the point is exactly the same, we can see that on the meta tags, we can find that the version of the Drupal is Drupal 7. Now, usually what you do before engaging with these two is you open a terminal and you do search exploit and you do Drupal 7 because that's what you found. And here you're gonna see a lot of exploits, but I think we have one missing point. And that is, what if search exploit gives none? What if all we have is just a CV number and that's all we have? So for example, from a lot of times when you do run Nestor scans or any other security tools, they often display CV numbers. So they, they're like, hey, I found that, and this can be vulnerable to that specific CV. Okay, and you write that CV to GitHub, you try to find exploits for yourself, and it's kind of a mess, sometimes you don't, sometimes you do, and it gets kind of complicated. That's where this tool comes in. 
This tool is actually called Spoit Scan. Spoit Scan is a tool which is one step above Surf Spoit and it's actually able to grab specific exploits based on the CV number. So it has a lot of statistics about, about where this CV or exploit was actually used. Was it published to HackerOne? Is there a, it's a key catalog? And a lot more details which are so nice to have. So essentially, this tool, all it works is with a CV number. In that case, we're not going to use Drupal 7 and use that into finding vulnerabilities or exploits with search point, but rather we're going to use the CV number, which in that case was CV 2019 7600. Now I've already downloaded this tool, it's on, the, it's on my opt spoit scan and here all we have to do is just clone it, then do pip3 install minus r requirements.txt and pretty much you're good to go. In order to save time, I've already done it, so we're not gonna bother with that again. Now when you have the tool there, all you have to do is do python3 and then spoit scan, that pi of course, if you wanna see the help menu you can, you can specify multiple CVs at a time, but that's not important. But to make it run, all you have to do is specify the CV number. It accepts this format. So CV, year, and ID. So if I do that, it's not gonna work, for example. So paste the whole CV string, CV, year, ID. When I run that, see what happens. Now from here, we have when it's published, general information about the CV, which in that case is Drupal before 7.58, before 8.3 and so on, allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary code because of an issue affecting multiple subsystems. That's the general CV issue which can be found in Google super easy. But now here comes the crazy part. This tool actually looks up several engines which are in that case GitHub, ExploitDB, Vonecheck, Packetstorm, and Nucle. It uses all of these engines in to find specific modules or exploits for your CV. And in our case, it looks like that. So it was able to find 14 publicly available exploits and it was divided into many two categories, GitHub and ExploitDB. Now from there, we have the normal modules, which are the one from Metasploit, the one which we can find from Searchploit, but it was also able to find a lot of custom modules from open source entries I can say. Now beside that it also mapped specific nuclear template which is able to identify this kind of vulnerability which to me is nice to have and nice to know. And now beside that we have also the hacker one rank, how many thing, how many times it was submitted and essentially a lot more details inside the of the references. Now this tool also integrates AI so if you add your OpenAI key here, it can also analyze the vulnerability using the ChatGPT. But I didn't do that, obviously. Now, the point is that here, I think this tool is great for making the search ex extremely easy and easy to navigate. Because in the past, if you find a CV, then you need to do that manually. Manually go to GitHub, manually go to Google, manually try to find exploits, and of course, manually analyze them. But now, this tool scrapes all the search engines, ExploitDB, GitHub, Nuclear, and so on, and then it gives you all the available exploits which it was able to find. And as you can see, they are quite a lot. Now from here, I want to showcase one simple usage of that. And that's when I loaded DeepSeek. Now inside the DeepSeek, that's what I did and what you can also do to automate the pen testing process. Now in that case, let's go through the same scenario where I found Drupal 7. And then I asked DeepSeek, I have a Drupal 7 installation and I want to secure it. Of course, that's how you prompt with an AI. Can you give me the list of CVEs that affect this software based on its version? Let the list start with the most critical ones and give explanation on what they do. Now DeepSeek was able to scribe a lot of vulnerabilities, including their CV numbers. So what you can do usually is when you find such kind of a software, a version, an engine, a backend, or anything else that has a version, you can always do the same step. First thing is go there and ask DeepSeek just like that. I have this software, I want to secure it, what are the CVEs for that software? Then he's gonna give you a list, in that case it starts with the one we just showcased, and then for each of the CV you found, you can go to this tool, spoit scan, paste the CV, and seek for publicly available exploits. Now that's why I think it's nice, because in the previous example we need to find a version, use search point, 
and search for exploit there. If we want to use GitHub, we need to do the manual search. And sometimes I personally cannot find seven to eight exploits like these two actually did find. So in that case, I think it works quite nice. It helps you to automate the searching for exploitation part. And I, actually, I'm quite happy with how much public available exploits this thing is actually able to find. Now, when you combine that with DeepSeek or any other AI, you can do a massive results with short amount of time. But also, I have one more advice, which is super important that you need to do, guys. When you find public available exploits, any of these exploits, I highly suggest to use, if you don't know coding, to use the same AI into actually scan the, the, the code and see whether it's malicious for you or not. Me personally, I had my machine, virtual machine compromised by not scanning code, maybe one or two times. So from then, I just decided each exploit I'm going to use, if it's not trustworthy, if I don't know it, I'm going to always scan it. So in that case, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know what kind of exploit that thing is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to poke.py. I'm going to also go to exploit.py. I'm going to get this code, paste them to DeepSeek, and let DeepSeek analyze them whether or not they are bad for me. Now, of course, if you have the coding capability, you can obviously do that for yourself. But I suggest you, even though you can do it for yourself, you can still ask the AI to find something malicious inside the PLC of itself. Because AI is going to automatically scan the code, deobfuscate any string like this one in Base64, and pretty much analyze the whole structure. But of course, you have to prompt them to be concerned for your own safety. Now with that, I want to thank you so much for watching this video. I hope this was useful and having this tool is amazing. I can see the cybersecurity community is growing wild. We have a lot of tools which are popping from GitHub like, like mushrooms, I can say. And we are getting into nice, nice time because now we are easing up and the more time passes, the more the pen testing process is getting easier. So thumbs up if you if you enjoyed this video, make sure to smash the subscribe button and I'm going to see you definitely in the next one.